Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we are yeah. happy. We are, we are very happy to welcome you back uh, yeah. after a long break uh, with our colloquium. Uh, this is the first uh, ever uh, virtual uh, I, uh, virtual colloquium for Accra. So we are happy to start something new, and uh, we are happy that we are still connected, even though we are separated by the distance and by uh, the quarantine and everything. Um, and I do hope that we will, we will still meet face by face soon, <laughs> uh, one day. So right now, um, I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Arceli Rosario. Uh, she is uh, president of uh, ACRA organization, and she is also a professor of uh, IS Graduate School. Uh, and she's also the chair of uh, education department in the graduate school. So I am very proud to uh, introduce her as a, a, a today's speaker. I would like to now uh, give uh, all our attention uh, to, uh, on, by the way, uh, I wanted to share some pictures with you and of some ACRA activities. As you see here, some previous uh, ACRA conferences um, we can uh, have some uh, uh, shots of uh, ACRA activities uh, worldwide. Uh, this is last uh, uh, worldwide conference on qualitative research in Portugal. Um, uh, yes, this is also from there. We have some local uh, trainings as well. This is in IS. We have trainings throughout the Philippines in different places. And this is last uh, ACRA conference in Cebu. I think some of you were there. All right, so now I, uh, I pass uh, on uh, uh, my chair to Dr. Arcelia. I am so much. Uh, I would like you to stop sharing your screen so I can share my screen. Okay. Okay, so, uh -huh. so I am working on sharing my screen. Give me a little time. Uh -huh. Okay, I will now share my screen. All right, so good afternoon, everybody, or wherever you are, whatever time, I would like to give you uh, warm greetings from the Accra, uh, from Asia Qualitative Research Association. We are very happy to reconnect with you again. You can imagine uh, our, I would say, disappointment when we were, uh, when we decided to uh, postpone the fifth APRA International Conference, but now we are very excited that in spite of the COVID crisis, we are able to come together and continue our learning. It is important for ACRA to stay committed to its mission, and that is to empower qualitative researchers. And uh, in our recent, recent conversation, Dr. Lomoa, our chief financial officer, got very excited as we were talking about the COVID situation. And he said, wow, this is a very, uh, this is a phenomenon for research. So this time you can think of many topics and we would like to take this opportunity to reach out to you so we can continue our conversation about uh, empowering ourselves regarding qualitative research. One important topic in uh, qualitative research is trustworthiness. If you remember our theme for the fifth ACRA International Conference is rigor in qualitative research. Now you may ask me, why is it that our theme is rigor in qualitative research, but 
why am I using the term trustworthiness? I'm going to explain that in a short while. So the overview of our presentation is uh, this. It will look like this first, very quickly. We will talk about the issues in qualitative research and then uh, what are the similarities or maybe differences between the terms rigor and trustworthiness. And then we go direct to the main uh, topic which is establishing trustworthiness in qualitative research and we are going to use the framework of Lincoln and Goba 1985-1989 which are uh, uh, they uh, proposed that one way to ensure uh, trustworthiness is by addressing four elements and these are credibility transferability, how to, uh, dependability, and confirmability. And for each element, we are going to uh, discuss what it is and then how to establish or address it, okay? And after this, uh, so does uh, how we do our webinar is I will do the presentation for 40 minutes and then we will have like 15 minutes or so for question and answer. So as I discuss and if a question comes to your mind, kindly write it down or put right in the chat box and then Dr. Lomoa and Dr. Subkov will uh, uh, try to look into the questions and we will answer as many questions as we can. And for questions that we cannot answer, uh, if you can send to us through email to acrapresident at ias.edu, acrapresident at ias.edu, we'll try our best to address your question. Okay, so now here we are, issues in qualitative research. I think some of us are aware, especially for those of us coming in the Asian region that there is lack of acceptance of qualitative research in academic circles. In fact, uh, there are universities that do not allow students to do a qualitative uh, dissertation. And the reason for that is because they say uh, qualitative research lacks rigor. Uh, what do we mean by rigor? Rigor refers to uh, uh, forms of standardization or quality. So that's the argument why uh, some scholars do not accept uh, qualitative research. And they say also that qualitative research is unscientific. Maybe some of you have heard or personally experience, you know, this kind of, uh, shall we say, criticism against qualitative research. That's why uh, we have scholars, you know, have tried to come up with uh, uh, like frameworks, how to evaluate uh, the criteria. I mean, what criteria? can we use to evaluate qualitative research? There have been several proposals. One is that qualitative research be evaluated using the quantitative criteria, which are validity, reliability, and generalizability. I have read some um, qualitative works which use these terms like uh, they explain how in their paper they address validity, reliability, and generalizability. So this is one school of thought. The other school of thought is that uh, we cannot use quantitative criteria to evaluate qualitative research. The reason for that is these two um, approaches, research approaches, are based on different philosophical paradigms, uh, different methodological approaches, and hence uh, it is difficult to like put a fit of this criteria, you know, like you put a mold 
this mold you use for quantitative research, and then you put this in qualitative research, this kind of criteria do not just fit. So, uh, uh, because of these differences in assumptions and many others, the proposal is that we should use a new set of criteria. And the other school of thought is that even if we have a new set of criteria to be used for uh, qualitative research, still there is an argument that qualitative research are so different from one another. And in fact, qualitative research designs come from different traditions and philosophical orientations that you cannot use one criteria or the same criteria uh, to another qualitative research design. An example for that is, uh, for example, uh, you are doing a phenomenological study and uh, transcendental specifically, and the goal of that design is simply to describe the life world of uh, participants in that certain phenomenon. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, for example, you want to study what is it like to be a frontliner during this COVID-19 crisis? You see, uh, you just want to describe the texture of the experience. That is, what is it like? You want also to describe the structure of the experience, like the precursor of the what that is now the how of the experience. So the goal of that is to just describe the experience or the life world of the participants, the frontliner in this, the frontliners in this case, uh, regarding uh, COVID, you know, being out there with all these uh, risks uh, and threat to life. So you want to explore that. But the goal is not to generalize, you see? So you cannot even talk about transferability. I mean, you do not have to address transferability when you are doing phenomenological study. This is what we mean by a not all qualitative research should be evaluated with the same criteria. So now maybe you will ask me, why am I using the term trustworthiness instead of rigor? I want to show to you uh, how literature use the, uh, uses these terms. For example, there are many studies who, which use the term trustworthiness or rigor in that title of their article and even in the content. It's like they say trustworthiness or rigor. So you use these two terms interchangeably. There are also studies that simply use the term trustworthiness, but they do not mention the term rigor. Now, so what is rigor? Actually, rigor is rooted in quantitative tradition. It simply means that you have observed or obligated yourself to certain standards. You commit yourselves to certain standards so that your findings are sound and acceptable in the academic circles and that your findings can stand the scrutiny of uh, your colleagues in your area of specialization. Aside from rigor and trustworthiness, there are other terms used in the literature. For example, uh, there, uh, these terms are used interchangeably, validity, credibility, rigor, and trustworthiness. Now I want to show to you how these terms have evolved. In quantitative uh, research approach, uh, the rigor criteria are the following, internal validity, external validity, reliability, and objectivity. And 
1981, Lincoln and Guba responded, you know, to this question of like, so what is the evaluation standard of qualitative research? So they tried to come up with terms, not to exactly find the equivalent, but rather to capture in some way uh, the issues that are addressed in each criterion of quantitative research. I want to repeat that these terms used here or these concepts do not exactly address the, the issues in quantitative. And I mentioned earlier, the reason for that is because qualitative research and quantitative research are not, are founded on different philosophical orientations and methodological approaches. So in 1981, Lincoln and Goba proposed an evaluation criteria and in some way tried to find uh, equivalent terms, like for example, for internal validity, the term they proposed is credibility and for external validity, it's fitness and reliability, auditability, objectivity, confirmability. In 1985 and 1989, they revised the terms and still credibility, credibility, but instead of external validity and fittingness, the term is transferability. And instead of auditability, the term is dependability and still confirmability, confirmability. However, as San Dilowski, 1986, I think I have missed to put the source there, that San Dilowski, 1986, proposed another set of terms. And for instead of internal validity, the term is truth value and external validity, it is applicability. By the way, the more common term for external validity is generalizability. So instead of generalizability, it's applicability and reliability, consistency and objectivity, it's neutrality. So I want you to look at the rows, rows from the left to the right. And so you, I want you to see that these terms somehow, uh, although they are different terms, but they somehow try to address the same issues, okay? So I have here internal validity, you have credibility, credibility, truth, value, external validity or generalizability, we have fittingness, transferability and applicability, reliability, auditability, dependability, consistency, objectivity, confirmability, confirmability, and neutrality. I would suggest that you familiarize yourselves with these terms because authors use uh, different terms. I mean, Although most authors, when talking about trustworthiness, usually use the 1985-1989 framework of Lincoln and Guba, but there are those who still use the quantitative terms, and there are also use, those who use the 1981 framework, and the, there are also those who use the Sandy Lewoski 1986 framework. All right, let us continue. And in this presentation, uh, I am following the framework of Lincoln and Goba 1985 and 1989. And these are credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability. For those of you coming from the quantitative uh, research tradition, I would like to repeat that credibility here is um, uh, an equivalent, although that I use the term uh, with some reservation, uh, credibility equivalent to uh, internal validity, transferability, 
to generalizability, dependability, to reliability, and confirmability to objectivity. All right, so let's begin with credibility. So what is credibility uh, in the qualitative research tradition? So it is, it, it means that the study measures or tests what is actually intended. So for example, you want to know what is it like to be a frontliner during the COVID-19 crisis. That's what you want to find out. Uh, your study will have credibility if the finding talks about that, the life world, or what is it like to be a frontliner. According to Miriam, the question to ask when trying to address credibility is how congruent are the findings with reality? So how congruent? Okay, so what is it like to be a frontliner during the COVID-19 crisis? Now we have been hearing stories about frontliners getting sick and some of them uh, losing their lives or some of them living in fear. So this is the reality, you see, according to news or perhaps according to uh, stories that you hear around. And now you embark on this study. And after you have gathered your data, analyzed your data, your findings show that Frontliners actually do not care. I mean, they are not afraid. And um, it's like they have like the, okay, whatever comes, whatever happens, let it be something like that. And they are not sensitive to what is going on. So the question is, are your findings congruent with reality? Well, maybe you will say like, it seems like it is not. Now, how do you respond to that? According to uh, several authors, they say you may not necessarily dismiss if your findings are not congruent with reality, but you should have an explanation why your findings are not congruent with reality, okay? So credibility is uh, ensuring that you are able to capture what is out there. What is the reality like according to the participants, not according to your preconceived ideas. According to Sandy Lewoski 1986, a study has credibility if, uh, suppose somebody is presenting in a research conference, or suppose a reader reads a publication and then those who read and those who listen to the findings of the study will say, and who also have experienced the same phenomenon, they will say, oh yeah, I also had that kind of experience, you see? So in that way, if that is the reaction of your readers or of your listeners, it is most likely that your study is credible. But suppose you are studying, shall we say, um, retirees, and your findings say that retirees are fulfilled and they are excited to live this new phase of life. But then those who read and those who listen, who are retirees say, mm -hmm. uh -huh. that's not quite my experience. In that case, what you can do is to provide, you know, alternative or even theoretical explanations why your findings are not congruent with reality. 
all right? So that's credibility. There are several strategies that we can do to establish credibility. And among uh, the authors that have really initiated proposing strategies were Lee Kun and Guba in their work in dated 1985. And here they propose seven, prolonged engagement, persistent observation, triangulation, peer debriefing, negative case analysis, referential adequacy, member checking. Um, you see these are terms that need to be explained, but our time will not allow that. So I just would like to say that my presentation is an overview on trustworthiness or rigor. This is the theme that we are going to explore in several of our uh, colloquia. This is a colloquia series from this time until our next face-to-face -face, uh, annual conference. Uh, so do not worry if some of these terms are not very clear to you, but if we have time, you can ask uh, a question afterward. I would just like to explain triangulation because this is quite common. And I would like to emphasize here that there are several ways to do triangulation. The most common one that we use is to have several data collection methods. For example, if you are doing in-depth interview, you do not do that as a standalone, but you pair that with uh, document analysis or focus group discussion or observation, right? That is one. Another is to uh, do your data collection in different time periods, in different settings. What I mean is, for example, you are doing a study on, shall we say, special children and how they interact with adults. So you are going to do observation. So what you can do is you observe them in the morning when they come to school. You observe them while they are in the classroom. You observe them during recess time. You observe them during lunch time. You observe them after class. This is what we mean by a, a varying time and varying spaces, okay? Or you can observe them as they interact with their parents, as they interact with their teacher, as they interact with a teacher assistants, as they interact with uh, other teachers. Yeah, so that's the second one. The second one is to have several uh, members in the team that do analysis. But if you are doing uh, qualitative research alone, what you can do is to get a peer, somebody who can do peer review with you, who can check your process and uh, all the steps that you are taking because you need to discuss with somebody. And the other one, of course, is to use multiple theories, okay? So among these seven, I'm explaining only triangulation because I know, like for example, you sent to us, some of you sent to us your articles for review and you mentioned triangulation, but I observed that you mentioned only uh, data, multiple uh, data collection methods, but please explore other types of triangulation. Shenton also endorsed the strategies used by uh, Lincoln and Guba, but in addition, he added the following, well-established research methods, random sampling, maybe this one is controversial to you, like we say in qualitative research, we do not do random sampling, but uh, I can explain that one later. Honesty in informants, iterative questioning, peer scrutiny, researchers' reflective commentary, expertise of the researcher, 
thick description of that phenomenon, examination of previous research findings. Uh, I will explain only one of these, or maybe two, and I would like to talk about random sampling. Now you will say, why should we do random sampling in qualitative research? I want to qualify that by saying, we always begin with purposive sampling. And when we say purposive sampling, the way we uh, purposively choose is based on certain selection criteria. For example, you have, uh, uh, shall we say, you are studying um, retirees. And you have found out that in your community, or maybe you are covering several communities, you have found out that you have 50 retirees that have met the selection criteria that you have set. Now, you do not like to include 50 participants, do you? Of course, initially, you would not like to do that. I mean, like, you can make a range, like you will say, uh, I will uh, choose eight to 10, you know? Always put your number in a range. You do not put like 10 or 12. No, you do not because you depend on, the, uh, on data saturation. But because there are 50 participants who qualify, then you do random sampling. That is the meaning of random sampling. The provision is that everybody has met the criteria. Now, there is a downside to that if you do random sampling because uh, you cannot, I mean, like, because among the, one of the criterion that you, uh, decide on is that this one is not included in your selection criteria, but it is like part of your hidden criterion. Uh, and that is like the participant must be articulate, expressive, you see. But when you do random sampling, the one chosen may not be articulate, may not be expressive. And hence, the data that you gather may be anemic. All right, maybe you want to ask me, what do you mean by iterative questioning? Iterative questioning means there are questions that you may repeat. Uh, you may reframe the question. Uh, you ask it another way. Uh, you may want to ask clarification. And this iterative questioning may come like immediately after. It's like a follow-up, a clarification. But, you know, um, like for example, in phenomenological studies or in narrative inquiry, we do not have only one engagement. I mean, we do not interview the participants only once, but uh, we have a series of interviews. So if you notice that there is something that you want to clarify, something that's not quite clear in the first interview, you can do the iterative question, meaning you can uh, ask that same question again, phrased in another way in your next interview. That is what we mean by iterative questioning. Now, uh, I am taking these two strategies here from Karkari 2009 and she mentioned about validity of data generation and validity of interpretation. Uh, what we mean by data generation is that we ask ourselves the question, how appropriate is a specific method uh, to answer our research questions and provide explanation. Let me cite, uh, you see, it's very difficult to master one qualitative research design and more so to master several qualitative research design. 
And so we have a saying, if what you have is a hammer, everything that you see is a nail. What does that mean? It means that uh, once you fall in love with one research design, it's like every problem that you see, you want to solve using that one qualitative research design that you know. For example, you want to know uh, what are the teaching strategies used by novice teachers. See, what are the teaching strategies used by novice teachers? And how do they implement these teaching strategies in the classroom? But because you have fallen in love with phenomenology, so you say you want to study this problem by using phenomenology. But if you look at the design and your research questions, they are not quite matching. Why? Because phenomenology addresses the question, what is it like? So your question can be, what is it like to be a novice teacher? Then their answer there may be like, it's like being lost or walking in the darkness or being in a tunnel, you do not see the light. That is the life world of a novice teacher, what it is like. But your research question is, what are the teaching strategies and how do they implement that? So your research method does not answer your research questions. That is what we mean by validity of data generation. And the next here is validity of interpretation, like how convincing the data analysis process and the researcher's interpretation are. Okay, so we go to the second and that is transferability. As I said, it's very difficult to assume that in qualitative research, as a researcher, you say, okay, I'm doing this study because I want uh, uh, other groups uh, or those in other settings to apply my findings. That is a high claim and we cannot do that in qualitative research. So what does it mean? So in qualitative research, transferability to other settings depends on the congruence between the context in which the research was conducted and the context to which the research findings are to be applied. They say here the sending context, the sending context is where the research was conducted and the receiving context, that is where the findings will be applied. How congruent are they? Are they the same? Okay, now, it is the reader or the practitioner who makes that decision whether the sending context and the receiving context are congruent. I'll give you an example. Uh, my colleague and I, Dr. Evelyn Obo, conducted a study on the, uh, the experiences of graduate student mothers these were uh, graduate students taking their PhDs who had small children, toddlers, uh, elementary school children, and whose husbands were also doing like full-time study. So both the husband and the wife were doing full-time study and the children were small. And our study focused on uh, how did they find com compatibility and balance between motherhood and graduate school. And so I presented this, I presented this study in Rio de Janeiro and most of the participants there at the time, I think a PhD graduate students received a grant uh, from somewhere and they were able to attend that. So several of them were there. So when I presented my study, it's like they got so excited, but the question they raised after my presentation was, your study is too good to be true. It's not true. It's not true to us. And so uh, 
I said, so why, what are your experiences? And they said, for us, it's very stressful. It's difficult for us to finish our studies. We were commuting, uh, you know, our husbands were also working in another place. Our children were, you know, studying and we did not have house help. And we experienced like, uh, we got sick and we had marital difficulties. And uh, so I said, uh, let me go back to my slide where I describe my research setting. And so I describe my research setting. And of course, my research setting was IAS. And so I described that we were in a compound and we had uh, apartments inside and our students uh, did not have to commute and the uh, seminary and the graduate school, usually these wives were in the graduate school and the husbands were in the seminary. Uh, the schools were very close to each other. The apartment also closed. And we had a church and we had a community. We had prayer groups, we had exercise groups, we had potlucks and everything. And we, have, we had professors here who also lived on campus. And so when, they, uh, we, when we reviewed the research setting, you know what they said? They said like, ah, so that's why. So you see, uh, the reader and the practitioner will judge, okay, this setting is different from my setting, hence the findings are not acceptable to my setting or not transferable to my setting. All right, so what strategies can we use? Of course, we have to give a thick, another term for that, is detailed description of the context and the phenomena so that the others who read or listen to our presentation will be able to assess the transferability of the findings. So the next criterion or element of trustworthiness is dependability. What does dependability mean? Now in quantitative, the term here is reliability, which means that when the study is repeated, uh, given the same conditions, the results are the same. But in qualitative research, that's not the concept. The concept is that there is constancy of data over similar conditions, or if similar studies were conducted with considerable care, one would anticipate that the findings would not be entirely different. Do you follow? There's a difference between saying that when a study is repeated, similar findings are achieved. For qualitative research, we do not claim that. Do you know why we cannot claim that? Because we do not believe or we do not espouse on single reality. We espouse multiple realities. And also we espouse that reality changes. The same participant may have a different understanding of his or her experiences, um, maybe days or weeks or months or years later. You see, for example, uh, you want to do a study on, you know, there is this experience like uh, new teachers receive their salaries for a long time. You have that experience like it takes several months and sometimes even maybe almost almost a year and so this new teacher is in this experience but then you had your first interview when this participant was in this situation but then one week later after your first interview this participant receives his or her salary and then you want to continue the next week ah most likely the participant's understanding of the phenomenon shall have changed, okay? Now, so what are the strategies that we can do to establish dependability? One is external audit, meaning there's an external examiner. Another is detailed description of the methodological procedure so that it's like your study becomes a prototype so that if there's somebody who wants to do that follow your footsteps may be able to do that. Detailed description of the operational 
detail of data gathering and evaluation of the effectiveness of the process. And uh, now we go to the next one and that is confirmability. What does that mean? It simply means that the findings are the result of the experiences and ideas of the informants or the participants and not those of the researcher. So what are the strategies that we can do to establish confirmability? One is that we will do external audit. The other one is audit trail. Now audit trail is uh, quite a complicated concept. So this is one of the topics that we will talk about in the future, like what you will do, what artifacts you are going to do, meaning documents uh, that you are going to do to establish your audit trail. But the idea of audit trail actually comes from finance where they have audit, you know, uh, an external person comes and tries to check everything that they are doing to see if there's no fraud. So in qualitative research, that is the same. You establish a trail so that when you are audited, the person will say, yeah, you have done it correctly and hence your findings are trustworthy. And then of course, triangulation and then reflexivity. Again, reflexivity is a concept that is quite uh, difficult, but we will talk about this one in one of our virtual uh, uh, colloquia and we will talk about how we can uh, do the reflexivity, what to do and how we can do that. All right, so we are coming to a close so we can give ourselves time for question and answer. We are now uh, on the last uh, strategy for establishing confirmability. And uh, that is again, detailed methodological description. Uh, one of the questions that is always asked me by my students doing dissertation is that, why is uh, chapter three, usually in our institution, that's the chapter where we um, describe the methodology and they say, why is it that the methodology chapter for qualitative research is thicker compared to a quantitative research? And the answer for that is because we have to write a detailed description of everything that we do and not only what we do, it's also why we do it and also how effective that was. The reason for that is because of the emerging nature of qualitative research design. I mean, in the beginning, you cannot really pin down and say, this is the plan, this is what I'm going to do and I will not change it. In qualitative research, there are times we may change. I'm using the word may, I'm not using you must. You may change as you see fit, but every change that you make must be rationalized and also you may even give a report how effective that decision was. That's why it's uh, the chapter part, I mean the methodological chapter is thick for qualitative research. So to summarize our presentation this afternoon, I would like to say that it is our responsibility as qualitative researcher to establish trustworthiness. Uh, sometimes we can say that um, our critics say it correctly. I mean, their observation is correct, that our work does not have rigor. But let us challenge ourselves to exercise rigor in all aspects of our study. And that to establish uh, trustworthiness or rigor, we can use this framework. I'm not saying this is the only framework. There are other frameworks that you can explore, but based on my literature review, this is one of the most cited, one of the most used, and that is uh, the framework proposed by Lincoln and Goba that is using the following criteria, credibility, 
transferability, dependability, and confirmability. All right, so that ends my presentation. Okay, uh, so thank you, Dr. Arceli. Uh, we have many questions here uh, that has been asked through the chat and through the Q&A uh, uh, of Zoom. So uh, let me just- uh, Do you want me to stop my sharing here so that you can share your own screen? Okay, I, I can do that, yes. Yeah, I will stop my share. Okay, yeah. all right. <clears throat> okay, let's just move this first. Um, so, so Kerwin, Paul, and Muhammad, and many others. Uh huh. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. yes, we always can. share our. We always share our. Okay. Uh, yes. No okay. problem. No problem. Okay. Then uh, next, Isabel, Muhammad, and many others <clears throat> also would like to uh, know if we are going to share the recording. Uh, for me, there's no problem, but I don't know what you think, uh, Dr. Pavel. And yes, uh, we, I, I was going to say that uh, we will uh, prepare the video. Uh, uh, and uh, upload it to our uh, uh, Facebook uh, group. That's so please right. follow Accra Facebook group. Uh, uh, you'll see that they are posted. Uh -huh. So you, we will post the recorded video yes. and we also post the presentation, the PowerPoint. Yes, we can send the PowerPoint and uh, also certificates to the emails that uh, were sent That's to us. That's right. That's right. Okay. Okay. Let me come on. Um, so, uh, a question from Leonard. Does it help to vouch the trustworthiness of the qualitative research? Mm -hmm. Or at what phase of the qualitative research does trustworthiness be observed? Okay, I would say yes, by all means. We have to... Uh, I think I have developed a very strong opinion about this one. I don't know what others think, but I just uh, feel that we have to show that our work is scholarly and can stand the scrutiny of our peers um, in whatever tradition they are coming from. We may not be able to satisfy all of them, but what is important is uh, we, we follow a framework to establish rigor <coughs> And your question is at what phase from the beginning to the end? From the time we conceptualize the study to the publication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe next time we can maybe take a topic on uh, trustworthiness and publication. That's one topic that we can talk about. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> here's another one. Uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, can, can you, oh, you cannot read that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but you can read, just read. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this one. Dear Dr. Arcelli, I have a question regarding dependability and consistency. May I know your advice regarding on how to establish dependability in intrinsic cases if the cases were conducted with different data collection due to different companies' approval? Ah, I do not really get uh, what is the meaning of this. It can be that, okay, uh, you have a research question and usually for every research question we say, okay, research question number one, I will answer this uh, by my interview data or, and shall we say observation data. But then, this is how I understand, uh, but then you say, because maybe in one company, you are not allowed to interview, you're only allowed to observe. And maybe in one company, you are uh, allowed to observe, but uh, you are not allowed to observe, but you are allowed to uh, do the interview. This is how I understand. Is that it? Different data 
collection due to different companies. Yes, yes. Um, actually, when we say dependability, it's like, uh, is your data, because here, when you are talking about data collection method, this is more of an issue of, uh, we use triangulation. This is an issue of triangulation because usually we use a uh, different uh, data collection method for purposes of uh, triangulation. I mean for, yes, for purposes of triangulation, but actually they say, most of the authors that I have read, they say that why we use multiple data collection methods it's not actually really to triangulate like uh, what he said in the interview. I want to observe if it's really true. Uh, there are other ways to check on the honesty of the participants or the, uh, shall we say, validity, you know, if you are really capturing. There are other strategies there. Uh, rather, the purpose of why you want to have different data collection method is because you want to get rich account which account of of the of the phenomenon so for me it's okay uh, the only thing that maybe you can do is to put this in your limitations i want to clarify in many qualitative dissertations or thesis we do not have a section on limitations or delimitations in the in chapter one we do not write about limitations and delimitations the reason for that is for delimitations for example all of these are specified in the chapter uh, in the methodology chapter where we say okay these are our selection criteria only those who uh, meet this number one number two number three are able to participate usually these are the things you talk about in delimitations now where do we write the limitations? The new trend now is we can put a section in the last chapter. You see, in the last chapter where you have the summary of findings, the conclusions, recommendations, after the recommendations, put there the limitations. What happened? Because I'm sure when you conceptualize your methodology, you said you will do these data collection methods, interview, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in each company but you were not able to do that due to some restrictions. You write about this in the limitation section. It can be one paragraph or two or three in your last chapter. Yeah, it's okay because measures or strategies for dependability are many. And actually you don't have, I think I need to clarify, you don't have to use all of them. You see, you have only to choose which are applicable to your study. Now maybe you will ask me, now who decides uh, which of these are applicable to my, my study? Of course you. And get a peer in your case, if you are writing a dissertation, of course, your advisor and your panel members. If you are just doing a study for, you know, it's not a dissertation, uh, your team, or you can get an external person or a reference person whom you can consult. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Arceli. Now, uh, maybe we can try some live questions from uh, some of the people who raised their hands. Mm -hmm. okay. sure. uh, maybe, uh, Mr. Gerald, if you can uh, ask your question. Gerald Balanga? Gerald Guib or something? Uh, ah, okay, okay, go ahead. Gerald, are you there? Okay, maybe I will, okay. Maybe will... he is muted. Yeah, let, let me see. Okay. Or maybe while you are connecting, if you can, uh, if we can answer some questions so I can okay, answer. Okay, okay, okay. So and um, you can work with those who want to do live. Um, okay, here, here's another, here's a very interesting question uh, from Mr. Teofilo. He said, uh, hi, Doc, can trustworthiness of data be achieved with one participant only? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's always a question of like how many, what is the sample size? Uh, maybe we can take sample size also as one of our topics. But to answer this question, the answer is yes. 
because in qualitative research, you can take one participant for even a dissertation. Like for example, you can do a narrative inquiry of like the whole lifespan, or maybe even at a specific period of a person's life, because in qualitative research, the issue that we are uh, asking is like, how deep are we going? Yes, that is possible. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Muhammad, maybe you have a, do you have, do you have a question to ask Mr. Muhammad? Hi. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Welcome, Mr. Muhammad. Uh, do you have Hi. a question to ask Dr. Arsali? Well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm working, I'm a special educator working with uh, kids with dyslexia. And currently I'm doing my PhD and my PhD involves a phenomenology, I, uh, IPA analysis, phenomenological interpretative analysis on the lived experiences of the emerging adults with dyslexia in post-secondary institutions. So uh, my question is, uh, basically, uh, I'm, I'm planning to use a lot of uh, <clears throat> Uh, technological tools to analyze my data. Mm -hmm. So if I do the, if I do live uh, video interviews, can I use a uh, uh, qualitative uh, research tool like NVivo or MSQDA to analyze the data without doing a transcription? How do you look at that? Mm -hmm. I'm not, I haven't tried, maybe Pavel and uh, David, can you answer this question? Because uh, I have not used in vivo, uh, but what I know with, for example, Atlas T and Hyper Research is the data must be like transcribed, am I right? and then put into the system, into the program. So I think the question is like, uh, it's the, the video um, videotape interview uh, without transcription. Although, uh, you know, there are, there are softwares now that do transcribe. uh, transcription. Yes. Like you just put it in and then the program yeah. will do the transcription for you. Uh, because, uh, may, may I just add? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. okay, go ahead. I just wanted to add that uh, uh, you need to be able to as attach the codes uh, to your data. So the way you do it, uh, you can do it uh, in the video or you can do it in the text. Of course, uh, text is easier. You just uh, select a specific portion of the text and then assign the code. Yeah. Uh, so you can do the same thing, uh, I guess, for the video. I, I have yeah, never tried correct. that yet. Yeah. You can do the same way the coding, yet that, that means you just uh, block a piece of uh, right. uh, video and then do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you. That's, Thank you. that's, Thank that's you. very interesting. It works very uh, nice. Maybe you know, mm -hmm. I want to share also, like, there are, like, using, of course, software. I want to emphasize that that will increase trustworthiness, use of software. And there are journals now who that will not accept uh, journal articles uh, where if the data were not analyzed using the software. So I repeat, using software increases uh, trustworthiness. So that is why the uh, readers or practitioners view uh, statistical results as trustworthy because of the use of statistical programs. Yeah, so... Um... Here's a question here that's popping up. Do we need to attach the transcriptions and in what part of research? Uh, actually interview transcriptions or even observational notes 
uh, especially when we are talking about thesis and dissertations, we do not attach because this, uh, it's part, you know, of the data privacy. We, we do not attach the transcriptions. Uh, but however, we get the significant quotes. And by the way, uh, including significant quotes improves confirmability. That's one of the strategies. Uh, because when you show quotes from your participants, we are showing that really this idea is not coming from us, but coming from our participants. Okay. 